Hi, it's Alison Watt, and uh, today I am interviewing an artist named Judith Jurica. I just recently discovered Judith. Um, she joined my Facebook page, Artwork Art Play, much to my delight, and I became instantly attracted to and interested in her art. And it just so happened I was lucky enough to go to a show of hers, which she shared with two other artists, at the Lake Country Gallery in uh, near Vernon. So I had a chance to see Judith's work real in, in real time face to face with her work and it, it was really wonderful. So I'm so happy that uh, she can be here with us today. Um, so welcome Judith. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Allison. And you it looks like you're in your studio. I am. My, my studio is in the upstairs of my house. Yeah. We actually added a story to the house for the studio. So. And are you, is it your dream studio? It, it's everything I could want. Yes. Yeah. Is your house in Vernon or is it in Lake Country? It's in Vernon, actually Coldstream. Oh yeah. Which is towards Lumbee from Vernon. Yeah. Right. Just a little out of town. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, well, what I'd like to do is just go straight to uh, screen share and have a look at the wonderful images that you sent me to talk about your work. So okay. um, I'm going to share my screen. And there we go. So oh, all right. Well, this is I put this one first because it's an earlier work. And I was working quite figuratively for uh, a couple of years at least and um, uh, fairly realistically, as you can see. And also though the subject matter was a little bit of a dreamscape, it was less than real, so. I'm interested, so this is, this is a painting that you did a while ago, but yes. it still has the bird imagery in it. It does, that, it keeps recurring throughout. Uh -huh. And this is actually a drawing, it's, what I did as far as media here is I started with tinted gessos mm -hmm. and then it's drawn into with colored pencil. So, wow, this is sort of pre flat acrylic paints. So I was tinting my own gessos to get the colors I wanted. So how long ago did you make this image? I think that's about 20 years ago, I think. Mm. It was soon out of right out of art school. And I think I had felt like I had something to prove. I had to show I could actually draw. Right, so, right. Yeah. So. Well, the uh, the tinted gesso that's something I've never done, but it gives a real depth to the to the work. Or it maybe it creates a, a texture so the, that the uh -huh. pencil picks up. So I see. Yeah, that must it must be that that's contributing to the depth. It's beautiful. Well, shall we move on? Do you have? Sure. Yeah, okay. Sure. The, the, and just a little hint, birds will come up again, <laughs> right? Yes, they will. <laughs> All right. So, so then I, I started getting really interested in the way everything moves in the natural world, the continuous movement of particles and molecules in everything. And I started spending a lot of time on Gabriola Island, actually, house sitting. I do that. I've been doing that for about 12 years now and started really looking into the tidal pools and getting quite excited about all the life I saw there. And I really wanted to depict it, but in more of an abstracted way. And I started doing a lot of mixed media pieces on paper. This, this is on paper. You know, I'm just a few miles away from Gabriola. I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I really, uh, can relate to this imagery and I also love marine life just as a source of imagery and um, shapes and you know I think one of the reasons I'm attracted to your work is because of that um, you know love of the biomorphic material that we both share in our work um, yeah and of course, Gabriel has got beautiful sandstones, which are almost almost look alive too, because they're so so sculpted by 
by water. I do you know, still I'm... go to do you still go to Gabriola every summer? I do. Uh, my next uh, my next trip to Gabriola is in August. So. Hmm. Well, and if you if I'm here, you should stop by my studio on Protection Island. I would love to come and see you. <laughs> Great. Um, oh, I love this one too. And then uh, these are more sort of map based. I've, I came across a book, as you might be able to see, of uh, ocean currents and maps of the currents. Mm. And I got quite excited about that because these were the same sort of swirling movements and and uh, pathways through the ocean that, that were of interest to me. And my last series there, that those were drawings and they were, the series was called Islands in the Stream. And so it was... Mm. Um, I really got interest. That movement just captured me and it held me for a good 20 years, I'd say, <laughs> still holding me. So, and this is based on the maps of the currents. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, they're, as far as patterning goes, they're actually really fascinating, aren't they? Do you know they that are. website? Do you know that website, windy.com? No. Oh, you'd really like that. Yeah. It's a, it's a website that has information on all the ocean and ocean currents and winds all over the world. You can oh, I would like that. Into, and the patterning is just beautiful. And they also, my, my very first job right out of high school was I worked for the Department of the Environment correcting hydrographic charts. So I had a lot of influence of those maps in front of me every day so interesting I got to be really interested in them what an interesting thread to pull through your work everything feeds our work it does it really does even this and you just really don't know it at the time that your brain is being fed by this imagery so. yeah yeah and you know it's interesting that like this the large scale patterning you've got between the islands here is all, almost like small scale could be small scale too like pebbles on a beach yeah yeah or those it's, rock formations right that, yeah, that i was seeing scale. on gabriola later yeah fascinating mm -hmm. oh i like this one too i like now, them all this, <laughs> this uh I, I tried something new and I, i'm still using it quite a lot where i'll uh do a lot of uh asemic or asemic writing on the on the canvas or board before I begin I get a lot of motion happening like a turbulence underneath before I start laying down bigger shapes and eliminating some of the smaller shapes and and do do you when you're doing the acemic writing do you have ideas that you're folding into it sort of secret ideas Sometimes I'll be writing some of my favorite poetry there, and uh -huh. and it usually relates to the sea. Uh -huh. So, yeah, great. And you can see a little influence of Matisse there. Yes, the cutouts. Those yeah. shapes. Yeah. So. Yeah. And another thing I really enjoy doing is pulling in little art history references. So I have old calendars and. And I'm really quite irreverent in cutting them up and using them. So, well, if they're mass produced, I think it's fair game. Yes. And then, are you a musician as well? I am. Oh, what do you play? I am. I play guitar and sing. Oh. So. Oh. So it's kind of your whole world is wound into this piece. It's great. Love it. Yeah, it, it oh. all feeds it. Sometimes I like to um, write on a painting and then paint over the words. And then I feel like I've left a message in the painting. That it's almost like a reverse archeology. span You sort of built up, build up layers on top of it. You know, only I know what the, what the words are <laughs> underneath. Just for- I, I like that too. It's a little secret language in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Now this is uh, this is only about a year ago, and you can see those charts just keep showing up, and they're in the collage bin, and they show up reg regularly. And mm -hmm. started starting to play with palettes there. That's a fairly limited palette, although I, I'm not really I don't use a lot of bright color. Some just little, little hits usually. 
-hmm. of bright color. It's just a little too much for me, I guess. But I really enjoy colorful work, but it doesn't seem to happen in my own work, so. I like this really chalky, flat, quiet stuff here. I have, for years, I painted, I seem to be painting in orange and blue all the time. Every painting started and in one way and ended up orange and blue. But I have um, more in recent years enjoyed the muted palettes and like ch almost chalky palettes too. I really quite like flat finishes too versus really shiny things. So mm -hmm. do and you? This big sort of bulbous shape has been appearing a lot and I'm still making sense of that. So I can't really speak to it very much, so. Right, do you, uh, how do you finish it? Do you, do you use a matte finish so that it doesn't? No, here's what I usually do is I, I give it a good coat of gloss medium, uh -huh. but then I knock it back with wax afterwards. So I've oh, sealed it well right. and then knock the shine back out. So, do but you, it gives you, it a real, a nice depth. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, do you um, feel it's important to put varnish on or not? Uh, I didn't used to, and then people kept suggesting that I should be finishing the work, and it's not really necessary. I don't think so. With acrylic, but I think with paper, I like, I like to know the paper sealed in there well. Yeah. And, uh, but the medium can, I mean, well, basically the medium is a plastic coating, right? So yeah, yeah. I know that. Yeah, I don't care for matte medium. I like a matte finish, but matte medium is a bit cloudy, so I. I try yeah. to stay away from that, except for gluing. So you and don't find that the wax cuts the color um, uh, quality like a matte medium? No, I don't think so. Oh. And is it, it just like, a, like an auto wax? No, um, uh, cold wax medium. Cold wax medium. Because I have like, uh, heard that you can use, what is it called, carnauba wax or something like oh, that? Okay, well, yeah. that would make sense. That's a nice, pure, natural mm -hmm. wax. Cool. All right. I digress. <laughs> okay. but that's, that's nice to have a chance to pick each other's brains on these talks. Yeah. Too. And you can, we can share it with our, our And actually I should mention person. this cream colored paint yes. is actually house paint. And it's, mm -hmm. I use Aura by Benjamin Moore because it it's quite a viscous paint and uh, get it in a pretty flat finish, like a, a eggshell kind of a finish. Hmm. So, and you just get in the little cans? Yeah, I'm I'm a great mist tint hunter. I'm always out there looking. <laughs> great. But I'm very fussy. I only like aura, so. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is house paints, the, um, the colors available in house paints are just, I mean, it's astonishing. I have a whole set of uh, color cards. I know you can buy the Pantone sets, but I just prefer the color uh, samplers that you get from Benjamin Moore. And that's yeah. what I use as my color cards in my studio. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's have a whole yeah. set of them on rings. It, it's very useful and it's a, quite a money saver too, so. Yeah, oh yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, onwards. Okay, this is really recent. This is just a week ago, actually. And it's, uh, this is a, how I've been working a lot lately is a, a lot of scribbling and, and um, waiting for something to sort of become important in the, in the composition. And then I'll start uh, simplifying areas. And like in this one, for example, there's sort of three dark areas and, mm -hmm. and I started taking some of the noise out around those. And, and I really, really like, um, areas where you can sort of see something underneath but not quite and i like the mystery of that so mm -hmm. do you have any um advice for painting out because that is one of the challenges to to resolve you know these very active beautiful surfaces that are so fun to create and then to, to paint them back and find structure is very important and I just wondered whether you have any ways, simple ways of doing that. Well, I often will take a picture and look at it in black and white. That to me, that always is really helpful. So, mm -hmm. um, and just identify which dark areas 
would make a nice composition and which which of the darlings to kill so, right. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah it's just it's yeah. so hard to it's hard to teach that to students to, and um sometimes it's hard to do in my own work too but it's so it important is. and this this beautiful pale path through here is is really gorgeous one of the um references i was reading recently said you should be able to paddle a canoe through your, <laughs> through your oh, paint. that's a good one <laughs> right <laughs> very canadian that, that that pink pattern there with uh the little fleur-de-lis Mm -hmm. That's from the cover of Julia Child's cookbook, The Art of French oh, Cooking. Oh, wonderful. So, so <laughs> I like those little references. So. Yeah, good to know that. That's great. And also some French toile there. Oh, yeah. Now, Where's that? This, sorry, where's the French? The French? Oh, sorry. At the little black area, it's just a little piece of toile, just sort of a selected little. Oh, toile. up here. Up there. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was wondering about that. And there's the bird again. Yes. Yeah, another bird. <laughs> and there's a bird. And that's gouache. And that's from my sketchbook. And I, I included that because I just think it's important. It's part of my process is I do a lot of research before mm -hmm. I do my actual work. And just everything about a subject that I can, I just try to investigate every angle and and fill us. I usually fill a sketchbook for each exhibition by the time I'm finished. And mm. those must just, be treasures really in themselves. Pardon? Those must be treasures in themselves. The sketchbooks. They're really important to me. Yeah, I'd, I'd say if there was a fire, that's what I'd take with me. It'd be my journals. So. Yeah, that's I'd a beautiful lost. little. That's a beautiful little study. So that's is that a house sparrow? It is, and yeah. uh, a a good thing to point out. It looks as though I was very careful, but I actually hold a brush. I have a Chinese brush that's about a foot long, and I and I try to hold it at the end. So a, a lot of that is really accidental. So trying to remove the tiny control that yeah. gets us all tight. Yeah. Because it always ends up being quite evident that it was very tidy and very controlled, and mm -hmm. I I don't particularly like what that part of my brain produces. So it's I much more exciting to have an element of surprise there and accident. So, ah, uh, yeah, I agree. I think um, one of the most common things that students come with to often to classes at online and and in face face to face is I really want to loosen up. <laughs> so we, you yeah. know, it's funny, like uh, I used to paint very detailed subjects because I started as a botanical painter and I still, I love them, but I wanted to break away from that. And that, and that happened a long, long time ago. Um, yeah. And now I have developed lots of ways to help people to, to loosen up. Um, lots, and it, lots it's funny how we, we all, we all, a lot of us yearn for that, right? To break out of that um, yeah. detail. And I, I still do that regularly. I'll get quite a ways into a painting and that part takes over for a while. And I I can kill a painting pretty fast if I, I'm not aware of that happening. Right. So. Yeah. Um. But I do love, you know, I, I love the detailed stuff too. And it it's it is this is this is that perfect edge, right, between detail and looseness. Like that to me is what where the really exciting stuff happens that that kind of balance between control and release, right? Yes. That edge. Yeah. Yes. Gorgeous. And that back and forth. And I think all mm -hmm. of my work is that going back and forth and I used to feel quite apologetic about the fact that sometimes my work was abstract and sometimes it was more figurative and more recognizable. And I just decided those are equal parts in my work. So I'm not going to apologize anymore <laughs> for that no. happening. No, I used to think it was a sign of not being fully um, developed or you know, when my work was bouncing around. 
Yeah, uh, I don't I feel think, that way. You know, it happens in every field. It also happens in sciences too, which, yeah. which is my my background. Like you are not encouraged to be a generalist. You're encouraged to become super expert in one narrow field. Right. And it's true in, in art too that, you know, that, and that's the sense that we get when we go to galleries and things like that. But, but actually, if you look over the life of a lot of famous artists, they did a lot of different things. Like look at Picasso. So I, I stopped, yeah, that's right. I stopped yeah. worrying about that a long time ago. I just decided to just do what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, tell us about this one. All right. This is from my current show. So uh, I actually, I started this morphing between woman and bird many, many years ago. And I, I left it behind for a while and I was working quite abstractly for a long time. And, and, uh, and then actually the curator of the gallery asked me, she saw one that I posted on Instagram, another good reason to use Instagram. <laughs> she saw it on Instagram and she said, Judith, are, do you still have those? And I said, I do, I still have half a dozen of those. And she said, do you think you have enough work for a show? And I said, I don't, but I said, I'm quite willing to go back to that and pick up where I left off and make some new work. So I think I had only six months or so to prepare for that show. And I just started picking up uh, women. Some of them are uh, from famous paintings, some of the elements and uh, some of them from Audubon books, et cetera. And started thinking and playing with ways that women could morph into birds or vice versa. So it goes both ways. Some bird bodies with human heads and strictly play. Yeah. The background on this piece is kind of interesting. It's uh, painted tissues, stained tissues. And I've been playing with those lately. And there is a really good way to lose control over what marks you're making is tissue has its own mind and mm. sucks up the pigments and disperses them and do you mean like just white tissue paper? Yeah, white tissue paper. Yeah, that's a big favorite thing of mine to do too. I love the way that when you collage it on, it whatever you put on it kind of floats on the surface because the white paper just disappears. I, I love that. So yeah. there was a quote at the show about women and birds. Do you remember that quote? Was it from a poem or from... Um, Oh, uh, famous writer. When women were birds was uh, uh, oh darn, I've forgotten the author's name, but uh, yeah, it was a favorite novel of mine, and that just that phrase was, it just kept taking me back to these images, and that's why I think I was primed and ready to go there again, because right. that idea was still there. So, I wanted to just um, read your part of your artist statement for the show because I just thought this was so beautiful and this may have something to do with these images that we're looking at. We continue to cling to hope and rise above despite our earthly sorrows, illness, grief and loss. Whether it is rooted in youthful madness or ancient wisdom, I think we have a deep need to hold on to a sense of wonder. I think that is what art is for. I love that. Thank you. Yes, and I really do think that's what art is for. I think ultimately that's that sense of wonder is what I'm trying to express. So, well, these paintings I looked at for a long time just because I'm a I'm a, a very passionate birder, <laughs> so I ah. I have really like birds and I've done research on birds and um, so I I really. Uh, and I also was one of those kids that was determined I would fly. This is also in your artist oh. that, you know, you were so convinced that you could fly. I, I, I knew it was true. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, one of the greatest disappointments of my life when I finally came to terms with the fact I would never fly, <laughs> at least not with my own wings. Anyway. Oh. All right. Oh. This is really recent too, and and it was 
I was just trying to take some risks, do things I didn't normally do, like staple a piece of fabric on and there's another piece of tissue and there's so many layers there. I just kept going until I, I couldn't go any further, really. I, a lot of people are always asking me that. How do you know when it's finished? And uh, I heard a really good quote this morning. I was listening to a podcast and he said he knew it was finished when it could leave the studio and go and live on its own. It could still <laughs> survive without him. So, <laughs> Like a child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any other signs to yourself when it's done? Uh, oh, that's a hard, such a hard one. You just, you just feel like it's, it, it reached a brick wall, like there's nowhere else to go. And sometimes that can be either a finished piece or a piece to just put aside and call a failure. It could be one or the other. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I always think that I sort of get the sense that something's done when it doesn't really matter what I do to it. It doesn't really make it better. Yeah. <laughs> and again, yeah. you know, it could be because it never will be or just because it's arrived. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that that, that, that brings up a, a good point, too, about not everything being golden, that some of them aren't destined to be finished, right? They're right. Maybe 10 years down the road, you'll bring it out and maybe it'll get happen then. But. But well, you've learned something while you've made that. You know, if it's a piece that isn't working, there's always pieces that we take away from that internally that are pieces of learning from that experience. Because even if it's just yeah. another tiny piece of learning to work with your materials. So there's really, there's really no failures, but it is very hard to let go of the attachment to the idea of a good outcome. And it's a, again, it's like a balance. It's what dr keeps driving us on, right? Because if we didn't care about product or a good outcome, then we wouldn't bother, <laughs> right? Um, no, we'd be doing true. something else, but but we can't get over focused on it, or we'll be so disappointed that that's another reason why we won't have the, the heart to carry on. It's very it's an edge again, right? Yeah, it is magic. <laughs> Now this, this just happened in the studio this week and I was, uh, it's something I've just started to play with really is breaking up the picture plane. And I was just rooting through canvases back here and I just stuck that on top of that piece while I was going through the pile. And I, and I turned around and looked at it and I thought, oh, wait, I, I really like the way that's breaking into pieces and, and mm -hmm. And it, it just, it's the start of the, my next series. I mean, that, that moment. So this isn't a finished piece. It's just an idea, the impetus for a series though. Do you know what the series is going to be about? Or is it just a, a kind of just visual the language? breaking down of the plane? Yeah. I mean, beyond that, I, I, I'm not pinpointing it. I'm just going to start with that and mm -hmm. build mm -hmm. from there. Interesting. So this is where, this is the last image, right? I think it is. Yeah. Okay. I'll just stop the share and then we'll get back to the chat. All right. So um, I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. Um, and as a start, what was your path to becoming an artist? I think we heard a little bit about it there, but maybe you could just um, tell us a bit more. Okay. Well, uh, I have the childhood stories, but did my mural on the front of my house, things like that with my crayons. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was always there. Uh, and then uh, the first thing I started studying, I didn't study right out of high school. I, I had babies and raised them to school age and then I got to go to art school. So there was an interim period there. Um, and I actually studied special ed first and one of the courses I took during special ed was art for children. And we had to keep a sketchbook and it, it just awakened something in me again. And I thought, oh, I, I forgot about this part of me. Well, I like to draw and, and I like to paint and why don't I do this more? And uh, before that year was over, I had gone to the university and, and put my application in. 
So, and was, then that I went, a, was that in uh, was that in Vernon or in Kelowna? That was in Kelowna. At the art school there, at the yeah, university. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I drove back and forth for five years and got my degree there. Right. <sighs> and then you you started a gallery in Vernon. I heard. Uh, I Vertigo did gallery, gallery Vertigo. I, mm -hmm. I founded that in the year two thousand and. We we had had a small gallery where I'd shown regularly, and it moved to Toronto. So we were left really without a good venue other than the public gallery here. And so I thought we have to start one. <laughs> so that was probably a lot of work, though. It was. That was eleven years that I was uh, the creative director there for the gallery and. My work came to just a really slow ebb during that time. Yeah, I wondered about that, yeah. Yeah, and that's actually why I started going to Gabriola. That was, I take a month every year mm -hmm. and go to Gabriola, and that was my studio time, really. So uh -huh. it was nothing but studio time while I was there, so. Hmm. Um, was there a person or event that uh, changed your path into art or through art? Well. The instructor that was teaching art for children actually made a comment to me and said, uh, Judith, have you considered art school? Like, this seems like this might be your path. Uh -huh. And uh, and she, I remember her showing a piece of my work and she made a comment that really resonated with me. And the comment was, it's not that Judith's work is better it's that she has something to say. And I thought, I do have something to say. <laughs> That's true. Uh -huh. so, and uh, one other incident that happened was I was doing a practicum in an elementary school and I was helping out with an art class and I really didn't like the way it was going. And I mean, they, you know, they were coloring mimeographed sheets and, and uh, I watched a child get in trouble for scribbling all over it. <laughs> and, uh, I can choose and uh, someone came to my studio door. <laughs> ah, I'd sorry to interrupt you. Just my, my neighbor That's... just bought me some white tissue paper. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. That's she's timely. One the, she's one of the artwork art play people too. Sorry to interrupt. Carry on. That's yeah. okay. So he was scribbling all over his paper after he had dutifully colored in the lines. And I went over to him and I asked him what what all the blue crayon was. And he said, the bear is swimming. It was a bear. And he said, the bear is swimming. And I thought, this class is just so wrong. And I thought the only way I can make a difference here is if I go and get a d degree so I get to plan the class, right? So. <laughs> I'm just picturing that wonderful drawing of the bear is swimming. I quite love that, my whole idea. But the, the child wasn't able to have the freedom to, to draw it that way that they wanted to draw it. No. Yeah. So they had to bring some creativity to it some to way. It. And kids will do that. Yeah. Even yeah. if it's in their mind. Wonderful. Yeah. That's a great story. Um, is there uh, something that you haven't done with your art? Uh, you know, an ambition, a new subject, a new phase um, that you still think about? working towards specifically? Well, I have some really big canvases here in the studio. And at one point I was painting in oils and I was just getting to that big size. And then I started developing a, a, an allergy to oil and I mm. sw had to switch to acrylics. Mm. So I've slowly been building up to that place again where I can attack a big canvas. So yeah, that I would like to do. Subject matter, I, I don't know very far ahead of schedule yeah. what's going to happen. Right. Well, I'll be interested to see what you do with the big canvases. Yeah, I'm Maybe not some quite of ready new, for it yet. Oh, I wondered whether some of that, that new ideas, the new ideas that are brewing would adapt to big canvases. I always find it surprising how with big canvases, they don't always take longer than small canvases because I like putting on the paint with things like rollers and really large brushes and that can go actually pretty fast. Yeah. And it's physically kind of 
the gesture becomes can become the mark, which I love about large canvases. I, I tend to really like work that's human size that I can reach around. It's not bigger than me. It's yeah. So twenty four by twenty four is my favorite right now. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I like the thirty six by thirty six is too. There's something very satisfying about the square. Something I was reading recently suggested that the square suggests a circle because it's oh. so, you know, because it's equal sided, right? So there's kind of in every square a circle sitting inside it. Okay. But, you know, conceptual. An, an abstracting of the landscape too is something that sort of hanging out there like a carrot. Uh, when I was in art school, it was uh, really poo pooed. Nobody did landscape so uh but isn't that silly i mean we're canadian i mean it's it's yeah. part of our tradition so yeah 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 i'd like to go there yeah i'm working in that area a lot these days uh what is your perfect day oh oh i knew you were gonna ask this and i guess you did <laughs> 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 and I thought to myself, first of all, I think beyond the snow here and um, it would be a spring day mm -hmm. and I, I would start the day out in the garden with a cup of coffee, watching the birds and checking all the growth in the garden and, and then uh, hopefully some studio time somewhere in there and uh, uh, a good nap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah I, I i love having people over family and friends for a good meal some live music i love to invite musician friends over for a, a jam around the campfire in the back so that that would be a good day i'm down for that <laughs> <laughs> that's great um okay what piece of advice would you give to developing artists? So I made a I made a list because I came There's up with really many one. ideas. Yeah. I uh, the first thing I put down was to learn what it is you love, to really make a concerted effort to look at art, read books, figure out what why you like what you like. What what lines do you like? What shapes do you like? And then keep a journal and keep track of all those ideas and build on them and um, yeah, just learn what you really love. And one of the, uh, the piece of advice I think that I got from art school that was the most valuable piece of advice was when you make something you like, make a hundred more. <laughs> Go into that idea, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, dig deeper into it. So. It's something we don't often do. We jump around a lot at the beginning, but if you could go deeper instead of farther, that's that's would be good advice. And it takes well, a lot of making. Yeah, to well, get to the good stuff. because that's kind of a piece of advice that we associate with craft. And this is part of you know. Sometimes I think we don't we don't realize that if we can apply some of the the uh, disciplines of craft to our art practice, there's nothing wrong with that. That is, it's, no. it's good. Like the more we, yeah. especially with materials, right? That's a yeah. great piece of advice. I love that. Yeah, make a hundred more. That's what one of my profs said. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that down and I've never forgotten that bit of advice. So, uh -huh. so um, stop worrying about style. That was the other thing. Everyone wants to know, well, how do I find my style? And you have your style already. It's just a matter of unearthing it. It's in you. It's not something you have to go out and find. So just keep making it. It's that make a hundred more. It all comes back to that. Make a hundred more. And your style will just emerge. So also a great piece of advice. And oh I like this quote. It's Austin Cleon who wrote the Steel Like an Artist book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, confidence is a con. And I think that's true. We're always thinking, oh, you know, uh, I'll keep making and making and I'll finally gain confidence. Well, if you want to be a really 
outstanding artist, you can't ever get comfortable. You always have to remain vulnerable. So you're never really going to feel confident. It's never going to come to that. You might feel uh, less fearful, but you have to stay on the edge, so. Maybe related a bit to the idea of beginner mind, you know, the Buddhist idea of the beginner mind that that's where we really create the deepest and most authentic work we, when we're mm -hmm. constantly in beginner mind. So we're, and we're open, you know, to, to whatever is happening. We're not, we don't consider ourselves masters. And it's also to me, I mean, I really agree with this, Judith. To me, it's also the sense that it's important to be humble in front of the work, right? Like as soon as we begin again yeah. to feel like, you know, we're losing that real authentic connection, which is about kind of wonder and being being open and and you know it's yeah it's i i think humility is really important as part of that that yeah i i agree yeah well great anything any last thoughts no not not really i just i just am grateful for the opportunity um yeah, I encourage people to ride out the bumpy places. Was, yeah. Right? Yeah. There's so much more reward mm -hmm. to come. The more you make, the, the happier you'll be. <laughs> That's for sure. Judith, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I know that um, viewers are going to get a lot out of it. I got a lot out of our talk, too. So thanks well, so thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.